This is like really the fuel of New York, you know? Like coffee is the fuel of New York. Imagine that in one of these bags, you have 140 trees. And how many cups of coffee would one bag make? One bag here will make you 700 cups. Yeah. 700 New Yorkers. They're more than a cup of coffee, maybe one than that. New Yorkers drink more than a cup. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's why we love New York, you know? All right, see it's turning? Oh and put the green coffee in it. Live roasting session, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You it's see like, they're beginning to turn color. This is exciting. Can we... Oh, you hear it? Yeah. Oh, I heard the first crack. Yeah. All That's right. amazing. This is why I like making these type of videos, because if you know how it's made, it makes you appreciate it way more when yeah. you have that cup of coffee. Guinness Coffee is part of the 100 oldest things of New York. It's older than the Statue of Liberty. It's older than most of the any architectural things of New York. Yeah. New York was a major coffee importing center for the United States. Guinness has been importing coffee since 1840. So whatever would arrive from the ship, Guinness will get it, you know. New York is a city of millions of people coming from every part of the world, working in every type of industry that you can name, living every lifestyle you can imagine. But there's one thing that brings us together. In the diners, cafes, corner store bodegas, and street carts, it's coffee. This dark liquid extracted from roasted beans coming from halfway across the world is one of the most traded commodities in the entire world. And it's the most consumed psychoactive drug among humankind. Before you know it, you're addicted. Espresso, cold brew, black with two sugars, perhaps a little cream, even an extra large latte with oat milk. No matter the drink, it's a daily ritual for many New Yorkers. Maybe that's why it's the city that never sleeps. It has too much caffeine coursing through its veins. One could argue that the financial industrial might of New York City is due to this drink right here, coffee. This ain't just a drink found on almost every New York corner, it's more. I'm Ariel. I grew up in the chaos of New York City, obsessed with trying coffee shops all across the five boroughs. It's usually my excuse to explore a new neighborhood. I started drinking coffee at 19 years old. Yep, I'm a little bit of a late bloomer. It was my main way to cram for college finals into the late hours of the night. Usually I would drink my extra large caramel lattes with extra, 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 extra caramel. Yeah, not so good for the health. But as my coffee obsession matured over the years, I realized that there are so many questions that I want to answer. How did coffee change in this city? How is coffee made? And are the cafes that once stirred conversation and ideas endangered of disappearing in the wake of overly commercialized coffee shops optimized for stakeholder profits? Join me on an adventure through New York City to learn how coffee has changed this city and how the city has changed coffee throughout the world. Hello. Meet Peter Longo. He's been running one of the city's favorite coffee stores for decades, Puerto Rico. Its original location is in Greenwich Village. His father took ownership of the store back in 1958, and Peter took the reins by 1973. This store is a special place for coffee lovers. Immediately walking in, you're surrounded by the aroma of roasted beans hailing from Ethiopia to Papua New Guinea to Venezuela. This place is actually named Puerto Rico. Is yes. it based on Puerto Rico? Yes, it's the old spelling of Puerto Rico. The founders were Italian, we're Italian oh, that's American, right, yeah, yeah. and we inherited it. It's been said that they thought of the store as a rich port of products. If I may ask a blunt question, how you guys survived? You're gonna love this. Yeah. It took me 26 
years to buy the building. Oh, wow. Because I would have to go to my aunts and uncles. Oh, wow. Oh, so you bought it within the family. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I had to go to all of my aunts and uncles who had their shares, <laughs> yeah. including my mother, who <laughs> inherited her share from my father. And uh, over the years, I it made me cash broke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't care. Now this is a great example of a great New York City business. Multiple generations passing the baton, continuing the legacy of providing quality products and a quality customer experience. I mean, that's why I love coming here. The smell and the aroma is just intoxicating. But we can't just stick to the island of Manhattan in order to learn about coffee. We have to venture across the East River over to Brooklyn. Throughout the country's early history, most of the coffee that arrived to America arrived here at New York Harbor. The coffee business owned most of the real estate along the waterfront in Lower Manhattan, but was getting way too packed. Hence, they set their sights to the city of Brooklyn. Yep, the borough with a population of now 2.6 million people used to be its own city in the mid-1800s. This was prime real estate for the new coffee empire that would take over America. The space was right here, to what was known back then as the Walled City, now known as the neighborhood of Dumbo. In 1868, the Arbuckle brothers started a coffee business in Pittsburgh. They were tough competition because they had a patent for egg-based glaze to coat the coffee beans and preserve the flavor. Mind you, this was during a time where international shipping would have taken months, and vacuum seals were still not a thing. Hence, this glaze was a game changer to have somewhat drinkable coffee. However, the Arbuckles, like their Manhattan counterparts, knew that the future of coffee in America was in Brooklyn. By 1881, they had their roaster and stored their coffee here. Nowadays, it's a touristy food court and offices, but still carries the same name to this day, Empire Stores. They had 500 employees, 48 roasting cylinders, taking only 35 minutes to roast 2,500 sacks of coffee, weighing at 135 pounds each. Yep, that's a lot of coffee. By the 1890s, 86% of the coffee that landed in America landed here in the New York Harbor. By 1907, the majority of that coffee landed in just a few streets that are now known as Brooklyn Bridge Park. The Arbuckle brothers made the first national brand, deemed the coffee that won the West. Its name was Ariosa. But no one knows more about New York City coffee history than Donald Schoenholt. He's another coffee veteran that helped define specialty coffee in America. In 1975, he took the reins of Gillies, the oldest running coffee roaster in all of America, dating back to 1840. He was the first president of the Roasters Guild, along with being the co-founder and the first president of the Specialty Coffee Association of America. Yep, he's a big deal. Until very recently, he was running Gillies in Guanis, Brooklyn. He sold the company to Johan Pizenti, who started Stone Street Coffee. Donald is now retired, but he remains a fountain of invaluable knowledge about coffee. 1837. A young Wright Gillies, living in Newburgh, New York, was told by his family to, quote, go down the river, an old-timey expression that meant to seek your fortune in the city. And that he did. He found a job in a tea shop on Chatham Street and gained experience firsthand on the dry goods market. 19 years old, in 1840, he had gone out on his own. Here, at 236 Washington Street, Gillies Coffee got its start with a roaster that was powered by horse. George Washington became the President of the United States in 1790. So it's right after the Constitution is adopted mm. by the states and right after the inauguration of the first president. And there's a guy in New York City advertising in the local papers that he has opened and is operating a coffee roasting business. The business thrived and started selling nationwide. But not everything was rosy during the post-Civil War years. Roughly 1880, something went wrong. The proclaimed king of the coffee trade at the time, Benjamin G. Arnold, made an allegiance with two other prominent coffee firms to do the unthinkable. They called their syndicate the Trinity. 
and they bought the majority of available green coffee imported from Java in order to radically reduce supply from the market. In turn, this would artificially drive up the prices so they can make massive profits selling on the exaggerated margins to coffee roasters. However, the green coffee exporters of Brazil saw that the market was lopsided in New York. So they decided to plant massive amounts of harvest that year in order to flood the market with cheaper coffee beans. The Trinity did not see this coming. And instead of cornering the product and raising the price, the corner fell apart and the price dropped like a rock. And now you've got roasters that have coffee that they bought at the high price that they can't sell at any price without taking a loss. And they owe money to the guys who sold them the coffee. And they can't pay. They went broke. The whole industry melted. Gilly survived. And at that point, all the guys that had been in business before didn't. Oh, wow. And so, so we became the oldest overnight. Oh, wow. Meanwhile, in 1928, Donald's father, David L. Schoenholt, entered the coffee trade. His brother had come into the business, his nephew had come into the business, and now they found themselves in the second quarter of the 20th century with no sons to go into the business. By 1947, the Gillies family were looking for a buyer. And so my dad acquired the business, and he operated it until early 1960s, when I entered the trade and took it forward from there. Coffee has a history dating back to more than a millennia, with the legend of Kaldi, a shepherd in Ethiopia. One day, his flock of goats disappeared, and Kaldi went out to look for them. After some time searching, he found them dancing in the meadow. They were eating this mysterious cherry, previously unknown to the shepherd. He took a few of these cherries and brought them to the local monastery. Upon investigating and eating the cherry, the monk found it so bitter that he threw the cherries into the fire, thinking that this fruit was a trap set by evil spirits. However, as the cherries roasted and crackled in the fire, they let out an exhilarating aroma. Both Kaldi and the monk were entranced. What divine fruit have they discovered? Lo and behold, the cherries found in the mountains of Ethiopia were peeled from its mucilage, and the green bean inside was then roasted. Those roasted beans turned into a deep brown color. Then they were steeped in boiling water and would produce a drink that would go on to change the world as we know it. Seriously. This brew became the drink of choice for the Sufi dervishes, the mystic sect of the Islamic faith, who used it to inspire their hours-long dances throughout the night. Alcohol was prohibited in the Islamic faith, so coffee became the drug of choice in the Arab and Ottoman worlds. The city of Mocha in Yemen became one of the main exporters of coffee, especially as it made its way to Europe. By the 1600s, cafes were popping up in Vienna, Venice, Paris, and London. But how did coffee make its way to New York City? The earliest coffee houses that we really know about really date from the revolutionary time. So it would have been the Tontine coffee house. That's where the men conducted business in the same way that in London, different stratas of society went to the particular coffee houses they liked. There were coffee houses that were favored by writers. There were coffee houses that were favored by bankers. Lloyd's of London was a coffee house. The Lloyd's of London went from a coffee house that opened in 1686 and became one of the most powerful insurance firms in the entire world. And something similar happened in New York City at the Tontine Coffee House, which is situated at the modern day corner of Wall and Water Streets. This was a place where stockbrokers could conduct their trades. Because where else better to do business than by drinking lots and lots of coffee? They continued to do business here until 1817 and effectively was the direct precursor to the New York Stock Exchange, which is right now the largest stock exchange in the entire world. These coffee houses, which became famous, became places that other things grew out of, right. like the stock exchange or the commodities exchange. They also were the forebears of what we would now call office buildings, mm -hmm. because you could rent a room. 
these places, they may have sold beers and wines and liquors. This was basically a class of society that passed on the use of those beverages. They were above it. They drank coffee or tea because they were of a higher class. However, coffee didn't remain exclusively for the merchant class for too long. In the period during the Great Depression, soup kitchens opened up in the city, mostly in the poorer neighborhoods. And while we call them soup kitchens, but they were also serving coffee and donuts. You could have a coffee and a donut for less than a dime. That coffee would have been drip. It was made in large coffee urns. They had glass tubes in the front so you could see how high the beverage was. And they had faucets in the beginning. And I'd turn it to the right and then to the left to let the beverage fall. Later, you would pull down. New York is built by immigrants. Part of the beauty of this city is that you can experience the entire world by going from one neighborhood to the other. The same applies to coffee. New York coffee isn't a monolith, as contrary to the ubiquity of espresso bars in Rome or the typical cafes in Paris. Instead, here we literally have it all. But we cannot talk about New York coffee without experiencing a piping hot coffee regular from a corner cart in Manhattan. How do you want a coffee? A uh, small coffee, black. Black, no sugar? No sugar, no. Sugar, no. Got it. It's a nice steamy coffee, you smell it? You'll find people from all backgrounds running these coffee carts. This is a daily ritual for many New Yorkers from all strata of society. They're all a little different. You know, they all got different characters, but it's like when you grow up in New York, you grow up with a bunch of different characters. But for Raymond, originally hailing from Russia, he encounters tourists coming to experience possibly the most iconic symbol of New York. The tourists come specially because of these cups. We the do? famous cups, yes. Wow, okay, okay. They ask me, even ask me, I want a coffee in the blue cups, not any other else. <laughs> this blue and white cup can be seen in countless movies that take place in the city. Its official name is the Anthora Cup. The origins begin with Greeks seeking a new life in America of the 1920s as they escaped the conflict between Greece and Turkey that turned deadly. With them, they brought a love for coffee. Entrepreneurial Greeks opened coffee shops, diners, and carts all across the city. In 1963, the Cherry Coffee Company saw an opportunity. In order to attract the Greek clientele to buy their to-go coffee cups in bulk, the designer Leslie Buck devised a cup that had blue and white colors of the Greek flag, elements of the ancient amphora vessels that stored olive oil, and the warm message, it's our pleasure to serve you, in a typical Greek font. The Anthora Cup was a massive hit. In 1994, sales peaked at 500 million cups in that year alone. Nowadays, there are countless variations, and it remains a classic symbol of the New York caffeine boost. This is extremely hot, but... Mm. Over at the Long Island City waterfront in Queens, Jimmy Lai and Denny Singh are two military veterans who are bringing specialty coffee to a cart. They started this cart to figure out a way to help veterans start their own business. The city offers free permits for qualified veterans to run a street cart. Hence, Danny saw this as the perfect launching point. But these guys aren't just two entrepreneurs navigating a post-military life. They are also true coffee aficionados. So you guys do pour overs in this small little cart. It's yeah. every coffee drink you could probably think of. We do it out of this cart. Anything espresso based, drip coffee, pour overs. But what made you start specialty coffee? So during the pandemic, we didn't have a whole lot to do. So, you know, I brewed coffee every day and I was just striving for new results every day or hitting all the notes on the boxes that they label. Throughout that practice, I brewed a cup for my friend who owns a specialty coffee shop and just told me, you should just do coffee instead of becoming a coder. And I found out about all these benefits that the city was giving vets and I took advantage of that. My hands are tied because it's raining, but it's a beautiful rainy day with the views of New York City. I'm going to try a pover over here. Oh man. Oh, that's so good. Oh, I love it. Mm. Whenever someone asks me, what is the best coffee shop in New York City? Uh, it's a hard question because there is no definitive answer. You'll find countless vlogs and listicles claiming to have determined the best of the best. 
But from what point of view? Do you drink coffee black or with milk? Do you even drink coffee often at all? Do you want a pretty place or a place with a great cup of coffee? Because not all pretty coffee shops have great coffee and vice versa. So I was in a bind when my friend Jen, who doesn't really like coffee, asked me to show her the best coffee shops in Manhattan. How do you survive in New York City? <laughs> It's a drug, actually, and like I'm just not addicted. We went on an impromptu adventure from uptown to downtown and all around, tasting coffee at each place. Ooh, and what do we have here? We have some dark liquid. We have what's called black gold. And this is the coffee shop that everyone loves, and for good reason, Devil Ceiling. This is a challenge with this cafe. It's always packed, because it's hard to find the seat. But you gotta be like a true New Yorker to just pounce. The unique thing about Devocion is that they're one of these farms and coffee shops. So they actually have their coffee farms in Colombia, and they claim that within seven days, the coffee you're drinking comes from their farm and is already in your cup. Generally, when you're drinking most coffee in most cafes, those beans maybe two, three months. Sometimes, if you're lucky, like one month. But it's very rare when it's a lot less than that. Let me see what notes am I getting. I'm getting uh, Beethoven. Oh wait, we're talking about uh, coffee notes. Okay. Whew. Jen, come on. It's coffee time. It's coffee time. Come on. Chop, 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 chop. I need my fourth cup of coffee right now. <laughs> Ooh, so I end up getting a Fremo Espresso. This is my favorite drink to have in Greece. Two shots of espresso, poured over ice, and then whipped. Ooh. <laughs> I'm gonna need some tea. You're gonna be okay. <laughs> okay. It'll be fine. Okay, thank I you. promise we'll get you help. Ooh. Mm. What I really like about this coffee is that, to me, it's like classic American coffee. It has that punchiness, it has that very nice bitterness, that acidity to it. It's like office coffee, but actually done really well. That's what I really like about Fabrique. To me, it feels like a really old school place. That was quite a long coffee journey through Manhattan, but there is way more coffee shops in the entire city that I can't even fit into one video if I tried. However, Let's go to the place that changed coffee culture as we know it. Often we take coffee for granted. It's a seemingly unlimited supply available almost anywhere. But how does coffee end up cozied in our hands? Let's go on a journey from coffee bag to coffee cup. Step one, roasting. Coffee beans arrive on New York shores in bags as green beans. The most crucial process to unlock the coffee's flavors and aroma is by roasting. We join Johan Pizenti, who recently took up ownership of Gilly's Coffee located in Gowanus, Brooklyn. He shows us the process from green bean to roasted coffee ready to be brewed. Imagine you have 140 trees, a little one. So here you have the Guinness roaster, which is a massive, massive piece Huge right here. Oh, yeah. The fire was happening right here. If you follow the line, you can see where the heat goes. And inside the drum right there, you have an equivalent of 600 pounds of coffee. Once the desired recipe is rich, he is going to let the bean get out of the drum and cool down. So seven minutes. Seven minutes. You see? Seven more minutes. But okay. you see? Okay. I love, I love, how he's like, seven minutes. Okay. C'est l'artiste. Oh, right. feeling. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I love, you know, sometimes people say like, what makes your coffee so good? There's no secret. I mean, we, yes, you have a huge machine, but behind that huge machine, you have true craftsmanship. Oh, you can see that the coffee has turned already nice brown. Yeah. Huh? Whoa! Oh. C'est parti! Hey, there we go, wow. <laughs> that fuels New Yorkers, everyone. Look at that. While Gillies is a large-scale roaster with huge machines, there's a new generation of roasters using more compact machines. 
such as Anita, the head roaster at Arabica. Even though she works for a massive multinational coffee chain, they still do small batch roasting to provide the freshest coffee possible to their customers. At the Dumbo location, you can even mix the coffee beans to your liking to make your own personalized blend, which I took a crack at it myself. So I have my formula here. Usually you look for like inconsistencies. Put my beans here in the hopper. And then I press roast, press down, and I start the roast. Over in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Partners Coffee may look small, but it's running a huge operation. Sam Klein, the green coffee buyer, and Carrie Wong, the director of coffee, tells us the challenges of roasting in store. Honestly, it shows time and space. Here, it's really like everything's got to be efficient, efficient, efficient. Things have to move in and out quickly. Um, there's no time to sit on things. And what's the appeal of having a roaster within the coffee shop? Connecting our customers with the communities that we buy coffee from. I think it's right. also showing them that this is produced right here in Brooklyn. And the roasting really is something that's important to us and that we're passionate about. It's something that we really want to like show off to our customers. Step two, cupping. Okay, you have your roasted beans. The aroma is intoxicating, but how about the flavor? Coffee is taken seriously in this city. Usually you won't be served something subpar because every batch of roasted beans is taste tested to ensure quality in every single coffee bean sold at the store and in every cup that is brewed. This process is known as cupping. I ventured over to Williamsburg, Brooklyn at Puerto Rico's facilities to join Peter Longo for a cupping session. We'll pour the water into the cups and start slurping. It's the only acceptable form of slurping. Yes, that's right, <laughs> slurping and spitting. So these two will be the Sumatra. You pour the water in and it's gonna form a little crust. All right, you wanna break it. And then this is the Ethiopian. I'm going to let the grinds settle, and then you would go back in, and you'll slurp it to see the flavor is. And then you'll let it cool a little, and you'll do that again. And then as it cools, if there are any imperfections, they'll come out. Just lean all the way down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go closer, closer, closer. Slurp, that's good. Perfect. That's good slurping. Mmm. I get like floral notes. The citrusy yeah. is like a piquant flavor that the Ethiopians have. And the Sumatrans are heavier, so they're not going to have that. Why the second one? The sample is taken from a lot of bags so that it's a definitive sample of that entire lot. And then the body, what is body? The depth of flavor? The depth of it, how solid the coffee is. This has body. Yeah. This is good, solid. It's not too fragrant, uh. but it's deeply flavored. Mm. This one has that tang to it. It's a bit sweeter as well. Exactly. Yeah. I love the Ethiopian way more. This one reminds me of drinking just a black tea. Uh, well, this is a Sumatran. They're known mm. for being heavy. You so Sumatras roast... tend to be around the... that flavor profile. Exactly, yes. So this entire process has been very illuminating to really taste the finer notes of coffee and really get to see what goes into picking the perfect coffee. It really, there's a lot of work that goes into it. There's a lot of people who do this on a daily basis with years upon years of experience. Wow. Step three, <clears throat> packaging. We do everything from scratch. This side is our wholesale. This is our mail order side. We get that order just like in the retail store. I'm scooping, weighing, grinding. Here's an order, Zimbabwe, Peaberry, Tanzanian, Vienna, Sumatra. Little do people know that the biggest innovations in coffee packaging started here in Brooklyn. The Arbuckle brothers, which were wholesale grocers in Pittsburgh, went into the coffee roasting business. They built a huge factory in Brooklyn. Coffee was sold in whole beans, in big tins, and this would be sold to a grocer, and the grocer would have it on the counter next to a machine like this. Mr. Rawbuckle said, I want to package it and sell it in one-town packages. A Brooklyn manufacturer had invented a way of taking a German product, which we know as craft paper, and he made from it a bag, because until then, anything that was bulk merchandise that you had to buy at a grocer's was sold in a cone. 
He would pull out a piece about this big. He would wrap it into a cone, and now he's got a bag. You pour it in the bag, mm -hmm. and you fold down the top. But that's what everybody had done, and they had done it since colonial times. And now there was this guy in Brooklyn who figured out how to make a paper bag. It was sealed on the bottom. It just had folds on the sides and a flap on the top. And his first customer, I believe, was the circus. Peanuts. Yep. The precursor for the coffee bag in retail is the iconic brown paper peanut bag that you would get at the circus. Arbuckle wanted a package, but he wanted a package with a flat bottom and gusseted sides. And a Brooklyn roaster had tried it in 1864, I think, but he had failed. But when Arbuckles tried it, it worked. It's due to the innovation of the coffee bag that we can store, transport, and sell coffee across the world. No matter how remote a location may be, they can still have access to perfectly roasted beans. Peter shows us how Puerto Rico goes about their packaging. Uh, the paper bags, how do you guys make them? This is manufactured for us, but it has a polypropylene liner and a gusseted bottom, and it's got our tin tie. So it's almost same technology since the Ariosa or Buckle days. Or, yeah, or but this is a high-tech bag disguised as a low-tech because this heat seal it closed, and then the customer could tear it open. The next step after this would be going to foil or mylar, and we've kind of avoided that. We're very careful because we don't want to cheapen the brand. When we sell to the current wholesale customers, they get an order once a week. So their coffee has to be done in a week. We're not gonna overload them with a million pounds of coffee. As a customer, I prefer the way you're doing it yeah. because I've been to the supermarket many times and some brands I love, but they're starting to be three months old. Yeah, four months you can't old. drink that. Ah, you can't drink coffee that's that old. Yeah, Please. yeah exactly. It's gotta be roasted <coughs> few days from when you get it home. It's gotta come at you and go, oh man, this is dynamite, not Peter is one example of the best of New York coffee. But if you ever spent time in this city, you'll know that there's a full spectrum of the quality you can get in a coffee. It could go from the overly burnt coffee to the cup doused in sugar and cream to a super expensive $10 decadent latte. After meeting coffee people across the city, one name kept coming up in order to learn everything and anything that there is to know about preparing the perfect brew. Listen, 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 listen. Once again, the secret to a great cup of coffee is however you like it. <laughs> so if you need, <laughs> if you need butter in your coffee, okay? Bless you. Meet Joseph Gonzalez. He runs Espresso State of Mind, a mix of coffee catering business with a barista community that runs regular competitions where the best of the best showcase their finest latte art and other skills, along with also teaching coffee professionals on how to hone down their craft and coffee business owners on how to best run their business. He's also a fellow New Yorican like myself. My first memory of drinking a cup of coffee was sitting down with my grandmother at probably about four or five years old in the kitchen and grandma made me a cafe con leche with way too much sugar. And, and scalding milk? And, and, and scold, you fucking yeah. know it. I'm that's, sorry. That's literally the <laughs> recipe. I venture far away to the depths of Astoria, Queens to Chateau Le Wolf, a pet friendly cafe by the waterfront where Joseph also conducts his classes. One question kept rattling in my mind, and I think Joseph is the perfect person to ask. What is New York coffee? You start picking up a coffee here and there at your local bodega, and I guess that, that would be what's considered a New York coffee. Something strong, something forceful, something that you have to put milk and sugar into right. just to drink it. And to be honest with you, it's not that it's a strong cup of coffee, because usually those coffees aren't really that strong. It's just a bad cup of coffee, and you have to add a ton of milk and sugar into it to actually enjoy the right. coffee. Like you know, diner coffee, so yeah. you have that burnt taste. Exactly. Too. And to be honest with you, it's not that people were trying to burn or make their coffee bad. Um, one, it was the old concepts and ways of making coffee. So like like diners never really have like the best equipment and stuff. By the way, Percolator is the worst brewer in the world right. because it is just hot water re-going over and over and over into the coffee beans. And it doesn't stop until you take the beans out and no one ever does. And that's why you get that interesting flavor at diners. Yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, the reason I'm making this documentary in the first place is because I love visiting coffee shops. They come in all different styles and sizes and fit every preference for the vibe that you want. However, at the center of every cafe is the barista. The term is derived from Italian, meaning barkeeper. In other words, it's the person behind the counter that whips up your favorite caffeinated brew to your specifications. Some baristas are doing this job as a side gig to make money to support whatever their real passion is. But for other baristas, this is their real passion. Here's the wonderful world of coffee drinks. Anyone can learn to make a coffee. Okay. I, ultimately, there's really like no wrong way of making coffee. At the end of the day, it's how, if you like it or not. That's like, you, you make the coffee, if you like it, that's the right way. Espresso. We pull 18 gram shot. For espresso, I would recommend 0.1 off. We're using 18, so we can go anywhere from 17.9 to 18.1 grams, and that is gonna keep the flavor the same. Pressurized hot water is sent through a puck of impacted grounded coffee in order to make a syrupy textured shot of coffee. It can be enjoyed alone as a quick shot during the day or after a meal. It can be enjoyed with a little hot water to make an Americano, or a little cold water and ice to make an iced Americano, or as the base for a latte drink, both hot and cold. Dialing in the perfect espresso marks the difference between an okay barista and a great one. Best way to have a cup of coffee is however you like it. Lattes and other milk-based so espresso drinks. This is the beverage that took New York by storm. First with the influx of Italian cafes popping up in the 1930s in neighborhoods like Greenwich Village. The first obsession was with cappuccinos. But by the 1990s, due to the popularity of Starbucks, the new obsession were lattes. To many baristas, this combination of espresso and milk is the launching point of experimentation and the pursuit of mastery, such as perfecting latte art. For latte art, whenever a drink is ordered, you should always be milk ready first, so that way you have your milk available, so that way while your shot is pulling, you can steam your milk and finish your drink within a minute. So it takes about 30 seconds for a shot of espresso to get pulled, and then it should take about 15 to 20 seconds to steam your milk. We have our milk ready. We have our espresso shot ready. Whenever you turn on your steam wand, you will always see a little bit of water kind of come out. We will always purge to get as much as that water out because otherwise that water will get into your milk and make it a little bit more difficult for you to actually steam. From then, I am looking to get the top of my milk, the surface, in between this line and this imaginary line right here on the bottom. And then tilt a little bit, and then as soon as I turn on my milk, it should spin and aerate at the same time. After, you are looking for that beautiful wet paint consistency and then tilt my cup to give myself a bit of a pool. I am going to start pouring inside. The goal is to get your milk to jump down underneath the espresso and rise your espresso up so that you have your base or your canvas to paint. Oh, that's so sick. Incredible, that is amazing. Wow, that is beautiful. La Mona Lisa, el Da Vinci de Café. Try to Brazil yet. No. Drip coffee. This is the classic New York brew. Here since the Tantine coffee house days of the 1700s, also known as filtered coffee. It comes in many forms, such as the percolator coffee in the typical diner, bodega, or gas station, or in large containers with the spout, as Donald described earlier, or pour overs, which can be found in many specialty cafes today. What's really great about a pour over is it allows you to control all aspects of the brewing method. Every different method of extraction is going to give a different flavor as well as a different experience. I like my 22 grams. Got my scale. So first thing we're gonna do is pour along this side right here. 
so that our filter sticks on. To get rid of that paper taste, I am just swirling the hot water that's inside to make this hot, so that way when our hot coffee goes inside, it doesn't go into a cold pitcher. Toss this out, and then we're gonna have a little fun with a little bit of magic. I like to do a 22 gram start. Lightly shake it so that it is as flat as can be. Don't forget to re-tear your scale. And then I am going to do a 60 gram bloom, which means add water to this till I get 60 grams. A bloom allows your coffee to get rid of any excess gas that might give it a bad flavor. Also, it allows your coffee to properly saturate. So when I continue adding water moving forward, it will attract to the coffee rather than try to run away. I follow a one to 15 ratio. So since I'm starting with 22, my end total is looking to be 330 grams. So I start first with 60, and then from 60, I bring it up to 150, then 240, and then 330. Now before it dries out, I am gonna then start my second pour. So right now what I'm doing is just adding a little bit of the leftover hot water. Cold cup is going to equal cold coffee, or make sure to take it from the top of your espresso machine, mm. because this is literally a cup warmer. Oh shit. So right now, there's nothing else to do other than to swirl your coffee a little bit, pour yourself a little bit of coffee. A pour over is made for you to truly taste the nuances and all of the flavors, etc., that is in your coffee. We're gonna let it cool a little bit when you drink coffee that's too hot. You burn your mouth, you're gonna ruin your day, first of all, but then you can't taste the coffee. That's let it cool, the cooler it gets, the sweeter it's gonna get. That's the great thing about pour over, you really, tastes a whole host of flavors. You can smell it, you can feel it, and then that's a, the main goal of the single origin. And that's how you can tell if it's a good cup of coffee. You can taste the sweetness a lot more. Yeah. Um, what is a good cup of coffee? It's subjective. Is it subjective? <laughs> it is subjective. Um, look, you've got master cuppers that uh, will taste coffee for a living, right? They'll taste imperfections in beans, um, you know, and pick out defects. As everyday consumers, you know, even myself, I've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. If I drink coffee next to you, what I think is good, you may not think is good. It's like art, you know? Right. Everyone's palate is very different, so. Lastly, there's my favorite, cold brew coffee. It's coffee grounds. They're steeped in room temperature water for hours. It comes in many variations. You have your Kyoto cold brew coffee, which is a slow drip coffee over like 24 hours. Then you also have your nitro cold brew coffee, which is infused with nitrogen. It tastes similar to Guinness, very silky, velvety smooth, but it's all the same idea. It's coffee that never interacts with heat, causing for a very silky smooth coffee that is perfect mm, for a hot summer day like today. Could you describe what was coffee culture like in that Italian American neighborhood of uh, oh, here? here yeah, in the here South Village? The, yeah. Like this. Okay. So you had a lot of Italian restaurants. At 10 or 11, the restaurants would close. So the waiters would go to Dante to decompress, you know, because they had spent the evening working and so they'd go there and have a coffee and a pastry. There was that cafe culture. So it was a very lively atmosphere to drink yes. coffee in the cafe. Oh, absolutely, chatty. it was fun. Very and different from today, everyone's on their laptops. No, yeah. no, no, it was like <laughs> Gossip Central. And would the people come to the neighborhood to have espresso across well, the city? They came to see the Bohemians. We used to stay open till nine o'clock. And what would happen is, five or six o'clock, the local clientele would die because they went home and they had dinner. But around 7.30, mm -hmm. we would see couples come in and they might have had dinner at an Italian restaurant. So they were half in the bag. And they would come in and they would shop and we would chit chat, it was fun. And then they would go back to wherever they came from. But they had a night out in the village. So you had that mixture of local Italians and Bohemians and people of all different persuasions together and then everybody got along.
But hopefully it isn't the end for the lively cafes of the 1960s Greenwich Village. New York cafes for the past decade or so have been overrun with people on their laptops, making them into eerily quiet spaces, reminiscent more of a library. Combined with the fad of minimalistic interior design that has culminated to the point of sterility. One of the many reasons I love cafes in Europe is because people hang out there for hours on end, all throughout the day and night. The cafe is a place to chat for long periods of time, with old friends and new friends alike. It's also the place to read, draw, or contemplate alone amidst the caffeine-fueled chatter and the sounds of the city. However, it seems that many New York coffee businesses seem to optimize for profits, trying to sell as many cups as possible, rather than providing a great place to regularly come and visit. I'm Daniel Murphy, co-founder and CEO of Black Fox Coffee. Come in. Originally we created our spaces to be in high density and high commercial areas and we wanted to give people a little bit of a break from their digital life. So it was a place where we wanted people to come in with their teammates, their friends, their partners just for like that 30 minutes a day where they can have a coffee, switch off from the digital world and just enjoy a moment. Whether it's engaging with our baristas, having a conversation or a meeting, offline. I want to walk into a lively cafe that reminds me of cafes in Europe where it's a social meeting point, a place to talk, read a book, but not just be silent on our computer all day. So we intentionally did design the cafe for that, but it has turned out to be that place. Just that human engagement, the chit chat out, some music playing. It's amazing when you don't offer something, it's amazing what you see happen. This right here is the cafe that brought espresso to the United States. Cafe Reggio, located in Greenwich Village, dating back all the way to 1927, when an Italian immigrant sought to bring what was all the rage in Italy, which was espresso, coffee made quick for a quickly growing industrial Italy. So they invented these machines that would produce coffee like clockwork. Well, he brought one of these machines that is on display right over here, 1902. And it's one of the oldest espresso machines in the entire United States of America. This espresso machine is also famous. It was featured in films like The Godfather Part 1 and 2. Now, this cafe is legendary because this cafe has been the favorite of people like Al Pacino, David Bowie, the poet Allen Ginsberg, all the various beatnik poets of the 1960s, and the list goes on. However, this cafe, I think, is an excellent example of a third place. It's a place where you can hang out, chill, meet up with friends, where you can linger and spend a long time reading or studying. These places are more than just a spattering of chairs and tables with a seemingly endless supply of hot bean juice. These are places where people from all walks of life connect and create. I mean cafes literally kickstarted industries, financial markets, various schools of philosophy, and political revolutions. If the past 600 years of history are any indicator, cafes are amongst the most important places in society. However, do we take them for granted in the 21st century? Are we allowing cafes to become relics of the past? Why meet in person when you can easily do a Zoom call? There has to be someone out there who sees the societal importance of cafes. Luckily, one night as I was scrolling through TikTok, I came across Dr. T. Panova. She's a psychologist studying the intersection between urbanism and mental health. But what struck me was how passionate she is for maintaining cafes as a staple of our cities and towns. A third place is defined as a place that's not home, which is the first place, or work, which is the second place. So somewhere like a coffee shop, a park, where you can go and you can relax and be yourself and connect with other people. That's a third place. And according to the uh, person who coined the term, Ray Oldenburg, 
he thinks about these three places as a tripod. You know, like a healthy, well-functioning society sits on this tripod, which is stable because you have home, work, and the third place. And if you don't have the third place, it's not stable. You have a lot of issues that arise from that. And I think we're seeing that in society today. So a lot of cities are kind of lacking the cafes yeah. because I think one of the reasons why Europe even developed so strongly as a society was cafe culture. Some of the smartest men and women hung out cafes for long hours, starting to devise new political ways of thinking. The list goes on. Do you still see that happening in modern society, especially in New York? One of the greatest things about third places is that they provide a forum for conversation. They provide a place, a destination where you can meet with people like you and I are meeting right now and have conversations in a way that is informal, you know, relaxed, informal. It allows creativity to flow. It allows ideas to flow, this kind of an environment. And that's why it was such a crucial part of the lives of so many important people in our history because these were the kinds of places that they met up in, they socialized in, they bonded in, and they gave rise to these amazing ideas, inventions, stories, art, and it's necessary for us to have those kinds of experiences. Why is it necessary? That's, a, in some sense, that's the essence of being human. You know, experiencing things on a more complex, multidimensional level. Living. When we think about when you feel most alive, you don't feel most alive at work, I'm sure. And you don't feel most alive at home watching TV. You feel most alive when you're in the real world, interacting with people, having good food or good drink, having experiences, your senses are stimulated. That's when you feel like you're enjoying life, you're experiencing life, and it makes you feel alive. And that's very necessary for our mental health, our physical health too, for everything. But New York City is a notoriously expensive city. Perhaps it's no longer financially viable to run a place where patrons can linger. Daniel Murphy, the owner of Black Fox, tells us more about the realities of running a cafe. How expensive it is to run a cafe? What are the expenses? New York is a very expensive city to operate a hospitality company in. Everyone can guess commercial rents in New York are very high. Insurance costs are really high. Labor is high compared to the rest of America. That's some broad numbers. We try and keep our rent in New York 10 to 12%. Our target's 25%. Um, sometimes it can creep higher. Labor, we try and keep it 30%. And if we can hit those targets, we end up seeing some profit at the end of the financial quarters and at the end of the financial year. My friend Alex isn't satisfied. You have to be hospitable, be kind, accommodating, and give the customers what they want, you know, and make them feel welcome and want to come back. And I don't feel like there's enough of that in New York. I met Alex when I randomly visited the cafe he used to run called In Common near Hudson Yards. Immediately, I was struck by his passion for coffee and running a business with the best customer service ever. The staff there was so friendly that I just kept coming back and back again. He aims to recreate that magic again. I'm not trying to change the world, but you know the area that I'm opening up in, um, I want to I want to bring that to that neighborhood, which happens to be my neighborhood. So. So I asked Alex to show me the cafes that he already admires and what inspires him as he builds his new cafe. Why here? Lyria. We discussed earlier the concept of third place and Lyria is the definition of third place. You see people lounging, people hanging out, talking. Everybody's engaging with each other or they're just here hanging out like it's their own place. Right. And I think that's a lot of the culture in New York. I think people are accustomed to small living. They don't spend much time at home. They spend a lot of time out. And these guys have created an environment where people can feel comfortable. And this is, for me, the epitome of cool in New York. And that's why I like it, you know? And, you know, once you come here enough, people start to get to know you, same thing. You feel welcomed. You really feel, you feel like that this is a place that, you know, you're accepted. We went from Soho to Midtown to chat with a few entrepreneurial Serbians who have been running one of New York City's best bakeries. The bakery is called Banda Avanyon. The cafe is called the Tipsy Baker. And look at that display. That is a beautiful array of pastries and breads. 
We come from former Yugoslavia, or from Belgrade, Serbia, where the coffee culture has been, and it is, extremely strong. Not in a business sense, but just as, you know, as, 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 a, way of, as a way of life. A lot of people are hanging out in the cafes, and there's a lot of Man, coffee shops. Man, they're, they're hanging out in cafes, the, you know, sitting down and talking to your friends and sipping coffee whether it's an espresso or Turkish coffee, you know, or cappuccino. It's sometimes an all-day ritual. If you would go to Belgrade today or to Zagreb today, even this time of the year, you were like, is anybody working in this city? What's going on? Everybody's sitting outside and having coffee. It reminds me of what Johan at Gillies was telling me about the difference between European coffee culture versus New York coffee culture. If you would have said that to anyone from back home that uh, I've seen people walking the street drinking coffee, they would never believe me. They'd say, is that crazy? Why they don't take time? Because a cafe in Europe, it's usually a moment where you take a break, where you have to sit down, and that's actually used for break. Here in it's like used to go, actually. You start today and you need, like, you need that caffeine, so, you, so it's very different. But when you think about it, what is New York City coffee culture? What makes it unique, contrary to our European brethren? For the most part, New York coffee is still Bottega coffee. It's your get up and go, let's fucking hustle, because that's what New York is. Not growing up in New York, there is this charm to a cup of coffee here. Whether it's Bottega coffee, a coffee cart, where you can get a bagel or a donut with your coffee. It's part of what we are. Like like a, a New Yorker is a get up and go hustler, whatever it may be. I was very impressed by how much coffee people can consume every day and how important it is for New Yorker to have their daily uh, cup. Every coffee shop you go to is gonna have a different brew method. They're gonna have different coffee origins. So let's say you try our coffee and you go down the block, you get to try another coffee. And you go down the block from there, you get to try another coffee from another origin. It's that cup of joe, it's the thing that gets people going and it's that great level up. You know, you might see people outside on the corner having a cigarette. One person's got the day with coffee, one person's got Dunkin' Donuts and one person's got Black Fox. It feels like something that everybody participates in and there's no real judgment around and what you're drinking. I was shocked and impressed to see the volume and the passion of, of, of American in coffee. It's sort of the glue that sticks the, the city together in the morning. It's the experience, it's the feeling, it is the euphoria that it gives you, as well as the confidence that you can fucking take anything down. My friend Alex picked the perfect name for his cafe, Regular. It's just like the way many New Yorkers like their coffee. Two sugars and a splash of milk. No fuss, no misappropriation of Italian words to overcomplicate ordering, just simply regular. Also to be a regular at a New York establishment is a special thing. This city is so transient that it's rare to see the same person twice or even go to the same business more than a handful of times. But when you become a regular at the same place, seeing the same face behind the counter, that is something to cherish. So Alex and I ventured down to the financial district to check out the progress on his new cafe. This is where you're gonna open up your cafe. Soon, hopefully. Oh, I'm excited. Don't get too excited. There's, it's a bit of nothing right now. So the barista would be right here in this general area. You register and cake display, coffee machine. As soon as you walk in the door, you are making eyes with the barista. You wanted that. Someone needs to be your point of contact. As soon as that door opens, you need to be greeted. You need to be made feel welcome. What are you doing seating wise? I'm going to redo the tabletops. There'll be a bigger table for this corner of the seating. One two, three, two tops. So chairs facing this way. Semi-circle tables, flat on the wall and come out to a little bit of a rounded finish. This will be the kitchen. This is the kitchen area, interesting. The track lights will be replaced. Please make them soft. Everything will be dimmable. Please, because this type of spotlighting is the bane of my existence Look. when it comes to going to coffee shops and restaurants in New York City. Because it's so bright, it feels like the light is right on uh, top of you. The goal is because we don't have much direct light at the front section we do, but it doesn't reach back here, is to make it a little bit darker, a bit more charming. Are you excited for the coffee shop? I'm very excited. This is kind of the fun part. The problem solving when you're designing and when you're building. 
it seems like it's a really hard slog while you're doing it, but then that little portion is over so quickly. You know, before you know it, you've been operating for a year, two years. How long would you love the cafe to last? This one, I want this one to run for at least, at least, 10 years. This one I want to be cemented here and, and stay in the neighborhood for as long as we can. Mm. They're about to put a museum upstairs. World Trade Center number five is getting put up and that's gonna be 1,300 apartments now rather than a commercial space. The whole area is getting a bit of a rebirth. What's your favorite part about running a cafe? My favorite part about running a cafe is the people. You meet people from all walks of life. Yourself, for example. People who live locally, everybody does something different. You can really create a strong network, whether it's a coffee shop or a pub or a bar, somewhere where people frequent. They become your regulars and you really get to know them. And everybody has, has a different story. You know, being a part of the neighborhood is very important. You don't want to be here for a short time just to cater to transient people, tourists. People live here too. You want to be here for the community first. I think Alex is right that the best cafes are the ones where you end up making friends. I mean, that's how I met Emma. I randomly went over to Arabica and Rockefeller Center in need of a caffeine boost. And Emma, who's the head barista there, was such a joyful presence that we became fast friends. Emma's story intrigued me because she has done everything in her power to escape the turmoil in her home country of Venezuela and made her way through the coffee shops of Colombia and Mexico to eventually get her dream job here at Arabica in the city. Okay. I didn't expect to end up working in coffee. I'm a journalist from Venezuela. I was studying college and I started to work in this coffee shop. It was the first specialty coffee shop in Venezuela. But I always said, I see the barista, why this person is so focused in the machine? So I was so curious and I was like, I want to learn. They started to train me. In Venezuela, that was uh, almost 10 years ago. And then when I end, I'm in New York and I'm being able to travel around three countries because of coffee. I'm being able to come here to working with Arabica because of coffee. Coffee saved my life and I want to dedicate my life to coffee. So working in Arabica, it's, it's like a dream. So this brand, since I was in Venezuela, and I was like, I want to work there one day. So I'm being moving everywhere, trying to get here. It was since I start to work with coffee and I see this, this is going to be my career. Mm. This is going to be my, my future. Oh, that's so, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that's so what do you love about coffee? It's like my favorite feeling, like watching them, they kind of make it like to that tree and then they turn around and they're like, this is so good. <laughs> it's going to be terrible. As you're aging, you know, these real pleasures in life, the list is shrinking. I like coffee because I like the flavor, I like the routine, and I need it to become functional. But one of the short lists is waking up in the morning and having my first coffee and a croissant of some sort. It's like a hit of dopamine every time I can brew something properly, just getting immediate results. It's very tangible for me. It's not aesthetic and out there and la la la. There's nothing more fun than putting a smile on someone's face than having them come from across the street and as soon as they walk in, you're like, here you go, Jim, have a good one. I could have them coming in here miserable and I'll make sure they leave smiling or laughing about something. Those experiences, those exchanges, you know, it almost feels like we can sometimes envelop them with a, a hug. Yo creo que lo más bonito que tiene el café es conectar a las personas que no tienen nada en los que conectarse fuera del café. 
todos vienen a, a tomar café en un mismo lugar sí. de todas partes del mundo. Todos vienen a disfrutar de una, de una taza de café, a disfrutar de varias opciones de qué tienes que darme. Y todos se toman su tiempo mm. para poder separar esos cinco minutos para disfrutar un café. Y tanto el barista como la persona que viene se prepara para poder darte esa experiencia. El café es experiencia. That is still the most rewarding part of the business and the, and the industry. This is key to happiness. <laughs> Then everything else is the roll of a dice. This is the case with first coffee houses of London, Paris and New York. The coffee wasn't good. It was known as some of the worst coffee in modern history. Mm. It's not <laughs> but, about the coffee. But that didn't matter. Yeah. Not to mention, all revolutions and all wars started in a coffee shop. Remember that coffee is one of the most traded commodities in the entire world. And it's mostly used for drinking. It's so commonplace for humanity that sometimes we take it for granted. We don't realize how much of an impact these roasted beans brewed into a flavorful drink has had on our lives and on society as a whole. But the impact is massive. So the last question remains to the man who's lived and breathed coffee his entire life. What about coffee do you think is so special? What about coffee do I think is so special? This is a beverage that warms, a beverage that helps you think more clearly, a beverage that is at its best when it's being shared with a friend. It promotes conversation. It gives you a prop in your hand. <laughs> From my angle, it appears that the two handles of the coffee cup are almost entwined. <laughs> it's a metaphor for the friendships that coffee makes. And it's not just friendship between you and the person on the other side of the table. It's a friendship that exists between small business people, and that is small roasters, small independent retailers, small farmers in countries thousands of miles away who have created personal friendships to bring you something that makes the beverage and your family and their family uniquely entwined. And uh, I hope that uh, through the ties that we've made in the last three generations, because it's now getting past 50 years of specialty coffee, uh, that this will continue to hold and be true. Uh, if we're lucky, um, it will be true. Hey everyone, Ariel here. Thank you so much for watching this documentary. Hope it was a fun and fascinating look into an aspect of New York City life. It was such a pleasure making this and in turn meeting some of the coolest people in the city. So be sure to visit these cafes and say hi. Let me know what do you love most about coffee in the comments below. Do you want to learn more about New York City? Check out my documentary about Christmas in New York City next. Stay caffeinated, my friends. <laughs>